Hello, friends. Welcome to uh, Be Waste Wise. Um, today we have uh, Rosa Arias with us, um, and she is the founder of the Dinosis Project. And um, this is our, um, and we've been doing uh, these webinars uh, with ISWA um, since early this year to be able to disseminate their knowledge to a wide base of um, audience through easily accessible and consumable um, for our content formats. And we've also helped um, Asian Development Bank and NWH Global also um, disseminate knowledge um, around the world. So if you are someone who's looking for a knowledge partner in waste management, then definitely think about Be Waste Wise. We can organize webinars for you so that you can reach um, a lot of people. And uh, we started doing this in 2013. And uh, every year we organize something called the 26, uh, uh, something called the Global Dialogue on Waste. And we have this year's Global Dialogue on Waste starting on September 4th and September 5th. Um, you can find all the information that's needed um, on uh, the website, or you can do a quick Google search on 2018 Global Dialogue on Waste, and you'll find links on where you can register for them. And uh, the themes this year are uh, new systems for North America and learning across the Atlantic. So um, go check it out, um, check um, all the speakers that are speaking and also register um, for the event. Um, now, uh, today's webinar, uh, we'll be talking about the Denosis project and um, Rosa will tell you about the citizen science part of it and uh, you know the timeline and what, what she's looking for in project partners and all of that. Um, good stuff. And uh, before we um, introduce uh, Rosa, let me just remind you that um, we'll be taking questions throughout the webinar. So if you have any questions or comments for Rosa, take, um, you know, make uh, use of this opportunity to ask her so that, you know, you can get um, them answered right away. And um, after all of that, if you still have more questions, we'll provide you the kind of details of Rosa so that you can get in touch with her and then learn more. Um, with that, um, Rosa, welcome to Be Waste Wise and um, how are you? Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm fine, thank you. And also I would like to welcome all my Dinosis partners that are listening, uh, like Nora, Simone and Cynthia, and of course the ISWA team and yourself. A uh, big thank you for organizing this webinar. No problem, thanks so much. Um, uh, thanks for you know being with us. Um, I think it's a great project um, that you're doing. I've been really impressed uh, since I came to know about it. Um, so can you, uh, where are you joining from? I know you're not in Barcelona. No, I'm in Galicia in a tiny village. This is the northwest of Spain. Uh, still finishing my holidays, but uh, I'm here with you. <laughs> right. So um, Rosa actually is in her vacation, but she, you know, agreed to do this uh, webinar in that. So that's really, uh, you know, great. And but she also had to find a place with the right internet connection. Um, okay. So that took a while, clearly. Um, <laughs> yeah. All yes. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, a driving school, by the way, <laughs> but. Uh, I, I have my driving les license with me, <laughs> no problem. All right, all right, awesome. Um, Rosa, could you tell us um, about the project? Why did you start it and how, how did it start? Yes, uh, I've been working in odor pollution since uh, 2004 in uh, two out of the three or four main companies in Spain dealing with it, uh, applying like the traditional method methods to measure odors. Uh, at an industrial level, we are talking about environmental odors, not indoor odors, okay? So uh, basically dealing with the annoyance that they cause to the citizens living in the surroundings of the uh, odor emitting industries. Most of them, uh, or many of them, are waste managers because they were like my first clients ever. And uh, of course, they are very smelly. So uh, I know this, uh, all the waste manager uh, management uh, part very well because I've been working in the all kind of plants. And uh, well, I've seen like a lot of unfair situations because there is no transparency with the citizens. There is no regulation that protect the citizens at the global level. There are some efforts at uh, maybe regional or uh, even local level, but not at the global level. And uh, there is no uh, like a common regulatory framework from for others. So what happens is that uh, mainly if you are a citizen living next to an emitting industry, uh, you are usually unprotected. And nobody is telling you what's going on or uh, if the industries don't have goodwill or if the city council uh, don't receive enough pressure from the citizens and force the industries to do something, then the situation can go on for many, many years. And uh, that's why um, this is one reason that I was thinking about developing this, this project. Another reason 
is that uh, all uh, how you measure odors traditionally is with people. Uh, we have the best sensor to measure odor, which is our own noses. This is a clear advantage to apply uh, citizen science in this case. And uh, also traditional studies like olfactometry or, or field observations fail to provide real-time data. So what, what, what we can do with the citizens that are already living in the surroundings of the areas of the emitting industries is train them and give them some tools that they can use to record other observations in real time for the first time. And this is what, uh, how the idea of the Gnosis started a couple of years ago. So we developed an app which is called Other Collect uh, for, for the citizens to be able to record what they were smelling, uh, where at the place where they were smelling it and at the time where they were smelling it. So the idea is that uh, we can map collaboratively with the citizens the situation in, a, in an area and after that, we can validate the data as other experts. We can incorporate uh, meteo data to see the dispersion and verify origins, for example. And we can also talk with the industries to see what was going on in the moment of the episode so that we can find out like uh, good practices or change maybe operations in the plant so we can change uh, our management or improve our management to reduce the nuisance. This is the idea behind the project. Right, so um, I, I think it looks like well, once a community moves closer to a facility or a facility moves um, to a community, once that happens, it's uh, really not possible for you to, and if something bad happens with the orders, it's really not possible to measure it or kind of um, accurately validate that it's happening. And then therefore, once you can't measure, you can't manage it. So. So that, yeah. that, so it's like there is no mechanism right now to be able to do something like this. You can measure it, but uh, only not in real time. I mean, and you always measure it in the emission, so inside the plan. So what you do uh, with the traditional way of measuring other pollution is you go to the site and you take samples in the uh, emitting points, like the chimneys or the basins or whatever you find out that it's causing the emissions in, the, in that plant specifically. And then you go there one day and you take your samples because it's an expensive thing to do, to take the samples and everything. So you have uh, punctual values of emission for that activity that you then use to estimate the impact uh, in the area with a dispersion model. So mm -hmm. you have to take uh, your weather data uh, if you find uh, some, some good data, that's better. If not, then it would be less accurate. Right. Then you, you have also the uncertainty of the dispersion model. And also, then you, you only have, uh, you are reliable in one uh, set of uh, other emission uh, measurements. So for, uh, with that, you can calculate like a mean uh, average uh, impact map. So that you can see the average levels of nuisance that are, or the, of odors that are uh, getting into the citizens where they live, but these also are uh, estimates. So uh, it's not possible to per, to see how they perceive the annoyance in real time with the traditional measurements. That's right. why we re reverse the situation and instead of starting like a, with a top-down approach from the industry and then calculating the uh, emission. We start with the emission values and we go backwards in time and apply the same dispersion models, but uh, for that exact moment, so that we can see uh, what was going on in the industry when they were, uh, when the citizens were perceiving the, the nuisance with the others, mm -hmm. like changing uh, the, <laughs> the situation. Uh, yeah, that brings me to some more points. So um, if uh, a facility has to do these um, order uh, studies, then it's really expensive for them. They have to bring people from outside somewhere else, but as opposed to for you, the people are right there in the neighborhoods. So you don't have to. Exactly, yeah. It will uh, decrease the cost, yeah, clearly, of the study. It's, it's, it's a huge cost decrease. And uh, this brings me to another question, which is, so um, you're, you're saving a lot of money for uh, the facilities by doing this. So um, how do the results from your... Um, model how do they compare with the the results that they would have gotten otherwise I, i'm sure they have some kind of scientific method um that yes, is already yes. dealt with for that so how does that 
um, how do the results compare? We will do that during the project. We are taking, because this is the first time that this methodology is uh, in fact created and applied, is the like pioneer project. So uh, we are doing 10 different uh, pilots, case studies in 10 different countries. We will be working in different areas with different other problems. Uh, for sure, some of them will come from waste management facilities. Uh, some others will be different, like big peaks, for example, or wastewater treatment stations or others. And we will be testing our methodology and comparing it also with the traditional methods. Of course, we, we will be, uh, since uh, we have two universities involved in the, in the project with olfactometry laboratories and so on, we can complement the measurements of the citizens with uh, olfactometry measurements or even sensory measurements, or uh, we will see in each case uh, how we do it, but for sure we will be validating. And in fact, uh, we will be applying, except for the citizen observations, which is the, like the good thing, uh, the new thing, uh, we will be applying the same dispersion models, but backwards, instead of, uh, you know, from the emission source to the impact area, we will be applying it from the impact area to the emission source to see if they match. Uh, what uh, citizens are perceiving and what is being emitted at the industries. So we will be applying, in fact, the same thing, but in a in a in a different way. Right. So um, so it is a very reliable model, even for facility managers. They don't have to worry about the quality of the data or that some kind of uh, mistake or some kind of uh, yeah. So it, it's reliable data that you provide them, uh, and it's verified by. Um, academia uh, later yeah. on, so so it's very reliable. Yeah. Okay, all right. And um, since you said you'll be doing ten pilot projects, can I ask you where are you working right now? Where do you have um, partners, and where are you looking for partners? Um, yes, uh, we have uh, uh, nine countries uh, in our project. Uh, we are fifteen partners, a fifteen partners consortium. This is a European project, by the way, funded by the Horizon Twenty Twenty program which is like the main research program in Europe. And uh, we have eight countries from Europe and one extra country, which is Chile. The countries are Spain, uh, Italy, Portugal, Greece, Bulgaria, the United Kingdom, Austria, Germany, and uh, Chile. So uh, at the beginning, we were, uh, we were going to do um, eight uh, case studies in the countries inside our consortium but they will be probably multiplying to 12 because of the big interest that uh, it's, been, it's getting uh, generated uh, by the project. And uh, we still have at least two locations to be selected in two different countries. So there are opportunities uh, for other countries that could be interested in uh, joining our project uh, for a pilot to join us. Um, what we will be doing with them will be to perform these pilots in their countries if they uh, um, provide us with a, a location. And uh, we, in all the locations, we work uh, together with um, uh, the academic, so we, uh, the other experts, the citizens. So they will, it will be necessary to engage with the community in the area that wants to participate in the pilot. But also we need uh, to have the support of the industries that are meeting the others in the area because we want to work very closely with them. I mean, we will be providing data, but also they will need to provide us with data to validate our data, so to, to find these situations to, to be improved. And also with the environmental authorities, which uh, usually are like uh, the local city council, which usually has the competencies uh, for other pollution, but it can uh, work also at the local level, regional level, or whoever is responsible for the other pollution in that area. So we always work with this quadruple helix model with the four actors. So uh, if someone is interested, uh, what we for sure will need is to uh, have the engagement of these four, uh, four stakeholders in the, in the area. Right, so um, friends, um, Rosa and the Dinosis project are looking for um, pilot um, communities, um, and if your community is um, having a, is having trouble with uh, order, you know, uh, use this opportunity to ask any questions that you have, so that you understand whether you can join um, uh, the project. And after that, you know, 
uh, we'll of course get you in touch with Rosa. So um, take this time, we have 30 more minutes in the webinar. So take this time to type any questions or comments that you have. And uh, with that, Rosa, could, could you um, tell, tell us um, about the status of the project? Where are you in the mm -hmm. project implementation? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, the project started in April this year, and it will last for three years. So we just uh, started, in fact, and we are developing, uh, improving the citizen science tools for the for the citizens. So other collect will be out probably in a month with a much more improved uh, version for, for everybody to use. We are building the International Other Observatory where all the information in relation to other pollution will be mapped and available uh, to solve this lack of transparency. Uh, so all of this will be open data so everybody will have the access. And uh, in fact, the pilots uh, were supposed to start in a year time uh, according to the initial calendar. So it could be like around next September. But because uh, all the partners are really excited and, uh, you know, and we think that we, it's time to start, we will be probably starting the Pioneer pilot uh, now in September or maximum October in Barcelona, which will be the first one. And also we have another five uh, Pioneer countries inside our consortium, uh, which will be also starting as soon as possible. And then uh, in a year time, uh, then a maximum, we want to start the rest of the pilots. So if someone uh, in the audience wants uh, to join us for a pilot, just contact us and uh, we will put you in the calendar. If you will not be the first ones because uh, we will work like this, like five or six pilots first, and then in a year, uh, the remaining five or six pilots, uh, but uh, you will get to do it. All right, sounds good. And what happens after three years? I mean, um, uh, I'm sure the H, the the funding th that's what you know until then. But what's your plan after the three years? It might be too early to ask, but still, what are you thinking? And um, will the facilities be a part of paying for something like this? Um, what's the revenue model that you're looking at? Yeah, in fact, uh, I'm just, uh, creating a startup to, uh, for exploiting the project results. Because, uh, of course, uh, we will provide guidelines for replicability uh, after our pilots are done and everything else. But uh, for sure, we can uh, replicate the model uh, in other communities with other problems. And uh, the idea would, would be to uh, do consultancy in other pollution, as I've been doing in the past, but applying our new methodology and uh, hopefully reducing the cost of the traditional other studies for the facilities. So uh, that would be like uh, my model. And also uh, I want to replicate the same uh, citizen science model for uh, tackling other environmental issues or societal challenges that can be also uh, helped by the data gathered by, uh, with uh, citizen science tools. Right, so uh, you want to scale this um, and then mm -hmm. have a proper revenue model, make it financially sustainable and then get into other environmental problems. Um, exactly, yes. Okay. Yes, and of course, uh, the International Other Observatory uh, will survive, hopefully, after the project. Uh, we will look for more funding or from the private uh, projects that uh, we may start doing, then we will uh, get some money to, uh, to make it uh, sustainable over time because uh, this is something that uh, it's really necessary to put other pollution in the map. And our ultimate goal, in fact, it's uh, to uh, influence uh, other policies and regulations so that citizens can be protected in a, you know, in a, um, a suitable way for everybody, not just uh, for the citizens, but also manageable for the industries and the local environmental authorities and everyone else. But something needs to be done. It's time, you know, to stop this uh, other pollution being ignored, and this is one of the our ultimate goals with the project. Um, no, I agree. I mean, um, odor pollution is such a big issue. I mean, it's such a huge um, uh, impact on quality of life mm -hmm. um, around the world. And um, in countries like India, um, if you have odor pollution, that also means that you have other kinds of pollution associated, mm -hmm. and odor pollution is one of the best ways for you to understand that, that there is something else going wrong you know, throughout uh, in, in the facilities process. And um, so it's like an indicator of something mm -hmm. wrong 
at the at the facility in cities in countries like India, and um, I've seen many facilities which have failed, and and they really impact the lives of people um, surrounding. Mm. Them. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, House flies and mosquitoes in everyone's houses, so it's it's a really big problem that is generally not talked about. So I'm really happy to you know see mm -hmm. uh, this happening. Um, could you? Uh, so um, I, I was thinking. Um, so uh, citizen science uh, also requires, you know, some kind of training or some kind mm -hmm. of um, guides for them to understand, you know, how to do this. Um, I'm sure the app has, you know, good directions, um, a good guide on how to do this. But how would they know what they are smelling? Um, I know, you know, our noses are really good and our brains mm -hmm. are kind of wired to understand what kind of smells. But uh, when it comes to um, um, so certain chemical spells which we're not used to, you know, mm. uh, how can they understand which what they're smelling? Yeah, in fact, uh, this is something that it's uh, standardized. Uh, there is one standard which is used to be German, it's still German, but now it has been adopted at the European level, which uh, deals with uh, field uh, observations uh, with uh, trained panelists. And it explains how you should train uh, people to participate in other studies. So we will be using the same methodology. Uh, in fact, I've been applying this methodology for many years uh, when uh, working with traditional uh, other studies uh, methodologies. Uh, and uh, the most important thing is uh, to uh, go with them to the other sources and explain them also the processes, what is going on there, how the odor is being generated, and uh, explain them, uh, like, for example, in a waste management facility, you have the fresh waste smell, then the litate, then the biogas or the compost. And uh, the good news is that the, these odors are really dif different between them, them uh, themselves. So if you take the citizens to the other source and they smell it, uh, you know, from waste is generated, this creates an image in your mind that you never forget. Uh, so then it's very easy for us because our sense of smell, it's really uh, a good one. I mean, we have, uh, it's the most, most complex of our senses and we have a lot of tools. And as you said, our brain remembers uh, very well when you smell its type of smell. If you do this training uh, regularly with them and then you check uh, for example, in the first observations or in the first weeks observ of observation, you check with them if they are really identifying correctly the odors, then they are very capable of doing uh, of identifying different types of odors and uh, doing very good observations. So what we will be doing with our pilots, we will go there also first engage with the community. We will use a lot of uh, different engagement uh, mechanisms also to motivate uh, everyone, uh, not only the neighbors, but also the local businesses, for example, or hotels or others that can be in the area. So we will work differently uh, with different engagement strategies, but uh, at the same time with the same objective, which is to motivate everybody to start doing observations and also train them. And uh, if the industries are collaborating, we will take them to the industry, inside the industry so that they will never forget the odor they are smelling and then they will be able to uh, recognize it once uh, they are far away from the source of their homes for example that's uh, that's the idea all right that makes sense um i think that's really good so we have some questions coming in um the first question it's not a question really it's a comment but i think this leads to something that we've been talking before the panel started and you could and you could respond to that. It's from Rodrigo um, Atilano. Uh, he's um, joining us from Mexico City, and he says that there are twelve transfer stations, and it is very common, uh, and the odor is very common and uh, nearby. And an average of thousand tons are managed in each station, mm -hmm. uh, which are since these are transfer stations, they have to be mm -hmm. in you know places mm -hmm. where people, are, people live. Um, and he says that uh, it is a problem with no solution right now. So um, if the transfer station management or maybe the city administration came to you and asked, how do we control or um, manage these orders? Um, and transfer stations are uh, places where there isn't too much infrastructure, but there is a lot of waste. I mean, mm -hmm. how would you, you know, respond? How would you help someone like that? 
Uh, we will need to study the case, of course, but uh, usually, in general, how you control others is uh, you confine the other source somehow. If these transfer stations are already confined and not open, then the, what thing that you can do is to uh, put the building under the pressure so uh, you uh, can uh, avoid uh, air going out of the building. And also you can conduct this air to a treatment um, facility like a biofilter or maybe uh, some active carbon that you can install there if the case is very, um, you know, big, <laughs> like uh, the, the problem is big. Or if not, maybe uh, we, we can analyze the operation of these transfer stations to see how they work. Because many times they, they work with open doors, for example, because of the maybe inside, because of the huge amount of waste, uh, there are not very good conditions for the workers because of the heat and also the humidity and many of them work with open doors, which is a really bad practice in relation to other emissions. So maybe we find out that they, this is what they do. And uh, if uh, we close the door, then we solve very much the situation. Uh, or let's see, uh, it depends. Um, for example, in some other cases, I've, I've seen that the, the trucks going in and out, uh, for example, the stations or the facilities, uh, if the, the inside uh, there are no clean conditions, and uh, maybe there is a lot of leachate coming from the waste that is uh, getting accumulated there. Then, uh, when they go out, they just take in the in the wheels all the leachate with them, and they just there's all the streets and the roads next to the to the station, and this is causing also a lot of uh, smell and uh, a lot of complaints. So sometimes it's not necessary to apply like uh, corrective measurements, which uh, require an investment such as depression and then treatment. But if you uh, analyze the operation and uh, identify some good practices that you can apply, the complaints can be reduced uh, quite a lot. Um, um, do you have any other examples from um, uh, uh, other facilities that you know, you've helped or that could um, get help from the Gnosis project? Uh, yes, I mean, all facilities that are emitting odors uh, are uh, susceptible of uh, being studied by a project like ours. I mean, uh, what we want to do is uh, to exactly find these uh, situations from, um, from the two factors that make, uh, that are, well, Odor pollution depends basically on two uh, factors. One is the odor emissions per se, that as was, I was explaining, they can be reduced by confining the odors and treating them in uh, some facilities like a scrubber, biofilter, or uh, whatever you prefer for the exact uh, situation. But also uh, another factor which is very important are the meteorological conditions. So uh, these two factors combined is what caused the others because uh, maybe you are emitting exactly the same um, the same amount of odor and one day is terrible because the domain, the dominant wind is uh, blowing toward the citizens and other day nothing is happening. Yeah. So uh, this is also something that we want to identify with our project, uh, the, the bad dispersion conditions for the emissions. So with that, you can also change uh, operations in your plant to reduce the complaints. Because, for example, if you have planned some discharge of waste or maybe your trucks are coming in in the bad uh, timing for dispersion, maybe you can change the operation and with that you reduce a lot the, the complaints. That's another example of things that uh, can be done uh, to reduce the other emissions in any emitting facility. Right. And um, we have another question from uh, Bo Wayne, uh, uh, and uh, he, he's asking, um, he would like to know how to be a partner of the Dinosis project, uh, but I think you already responded to that, and mm -hmm. the answer would be to get in touch with you? Yes, uh, yes. Okay. All right, so um, Bo Wayne, just get in touch with um, Rosa, and then she'll um, you know, let you know how to uh, be a partner, and then take you from there. And he also has other questions, but I think you've already answered them um, through, uh, in the webinar already. Um, and um, talking about uh, examples of you know where uh, the Dinosis project could be very impactful, 
um, you told me um, um, in our test run about um, a city where there was a lot of development happened uh, without knowing that mm -hmm. there were orders in the vicinity. And then mm -hmm. there was a lot of investment put in by the city, and then mm -hmm. a lot of people moved in. There was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot, of, a lot of money put into this whole process, and then now they can't do anything about the facility. So, um, could you talk to us a little bit about yes. that? Yes, yes, this is a typical case uh, of uh, all the pollution being ignored. I mean, my recommendation would be that uh, if you are a waste manager, the first thing you do before you decide the location of your plant is to check where your citizens are, your neighbors, and uh, the weather conditions that you have there, like the dominant winds, so that you can estimate, uh, even uh, do some uh, theoretical study uh, regarding the pollution, so to see if you will be impacting the neighbors or not, because it can become uh, like a nightmare after you do all the installation and everything else. Uh, in this case, this was uh, Barcelona. Barcelona um, is a city uh, with uh, around 2 million inhabitants, uh, three and a half in total in the metropolitan area. And this plan uh, deals with uh, around half of the waste of the city, so quite a lot. And uh, uh, it was built uh, next to an incinerator uh, and in an area that was uh, really depressed uh, by 2000, uh, early 2000 or so. A lot of Gypsy uh, communities lived there, so it was uh, like poor area, but, but a nice area, in fact, because it was by the beach. And uh, next to, so in fact, now it's like the technological uh, center of the city, uh, this area uh, has become. But uh, in 2004, uh, they decided, the city council decided to uh, create a new space. Uh, there, which was called the forum area, uh, to uh, perform there or implement a, a, an event, a very big event, which was called the Forum of the Cultures. So a lot of people were coming from around the world. They uh, clean up the area, so they move all the Gypsy uh, communities uh, away from there, and then refurbish and invest a lot, as you said, uh, building the new forum area and so on, but they didn't took into account that uh, there was uh, really next to a uh, waste incinerator. Then later uh, they installed there uh, an eco park, which is uh, an integral treatment uh, facility for waste as well. It has uh, also the wastewater treatment facility, the second biggest in Catalonia, which is uh, treating also half of the wastewater in Barcelona. Uh, and also a sludge plant for the sludge uh, being generated in the wastewater treatment facility. So you have a lot of uh, odors there, uh, depending on the type of the day and also on the weather conditions. You can smell fresh waste, uh, fresh wastewater, uh, biogas, or uh, litsate, or uh, a sludge uh, from the wastewater. So it's really terrible. I, I mean, it smells every day and uh, at every time. And this is one of uh, probably it will be our pioneer pilot uh, happening in the area. We're still negotiating it, but 90% uh, uh, sure that we will be working there. And uh, the thing is that they didn't take this into account and they decided to build this forum uh, without taking into account the others. So a lot of new people uh, move there. Now there is a new university campus there, a lot of hotels, conference places, very nice places. New rich people coming there, like Russians, Italians, and Argentinians, like uh, buying these one billion euro beautiful houses in front of the beach, but with a lot of smell <laughs> in their houses. So everybody is complaining. And this is a, a typical example of uh, bad management uh, with others, because now there is a like a citizen platform complaining uh, every two days in the press and so on. But what can you do if you just start it without thinking in the consequence? This is one example. Right. Uh, more than bad, I mean, it is definitely bad management, but I think it's also bad planning. Um, yes, yes. Bad uh, planning for, for the city, for sure. Yeah. So um, so um, in situations like this, then a project like Dinosis would be extremely useful and then could save a lot of money for everyone mm -hmm. that's involved. And it also gives a great, um, I think, platform for uh, people to, you know, um, for example, you said that there's a citizens forum, uh, which complains every few days, but then mm -hmm. for them to be able to do it in a much more scientific way, which mm -hmm. actually 
results in action, um, <laughs> I think um, the Denosis project would be a great platform for, for them to do that. And another question that I had is, um, is this place that you were, um, you know, in, in Barcelona, is it a residential community or is it mostly a tourist community? I'm, tr I'm asking that question because I'm trying to understand who lives there for how long so that that will also lead to, you know, downloading the app and training and all of that logistics. So. Yes, there, there are a lot of people living there. So there is a residential area, but with uh, two different profiles of citizens like the old Gypsy community still is living there, a bit far away from the area, but still there. But they have been suffering with the others for historically for many years. And uh, now we have the new rich people uh, with uh, the totally, uh, you know, different social status. This is also a challenge for us. We also like the area because of that, because we want to approach them and engage them and motivate them differently, but uh, you know, with their uh, expectations, managing the expectations with different levels of social backgrounds. And uh, also there are a lot of hotels because uh, of this conference area, there is a museum, there is a campus of the university, the Polytechnic University in Catalonia, a new campus going on there. So we also want to engage students. In fact, uh, chemical engineering is being taught there. So we hope to engage some chemical engineering uh, students that help us analyze the data and uh, you know uh, create uh, well impact and um, data and, and so on. So it's very complex area, but a lot of residents in, in, in there. Well, um, chemical engineers are the best engineers because I'm, I'm a chemical engineer. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so yes, I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, friends, last. Um, eight minutes or seven minutes for, for questions. Um, if you have any questions, please use the live chat window there um, under the video screen, a uh, video stream, and then let us know. Um, and oh, we um, people in the live chat are saying that they're chemical engineers too, so lots of chemical engineers. <laughs> Great. Right. So, they're uh, all in the, in the same page. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Vivek, how are you? So that, that's Vivek, someone who's worked with us. All right. Um, so, um, are there any um, final thoughts on, you know, what's going to happen in the next few months for you and um, what kind of response are you getting and um, so, so just tell us a little bit about that. Yes, um, I, we are uh, getting a lot of um, positive um, answers from many, many people, but I'm sure that uh, there will be some reticences especially from uh, industry probably, and also from uh, environmental authorities perhaps, because you know, because this has been under-regulated. Now they will see that uh, it's like, okay, another thing I need to measure in my plant, uh, odors. Uh, but as you said, uh, this can be used as a sign of uh, alert of uh, bigger environmental pro problems behind. So uh, for me, it, it has to be seen like an opportunity to improve management and relationships with the communities and transparency and so on. So I really encourage everybody to uh, don't be afraid of the results. We are not against the industry. We are not against the environmental authorities. We are not, uh, of course, we are supporting the citizens, but we are supporting all the actors. We want to, uh, you know, install like a sense of co-responsibility also in the citizens because we all generate waste. Someone needs to deal with it. So uh, they will see that it's not easy to treat uh, waste, that uh, it's necessary for the environment and uh, someone has to do it. And if it's next to their place, let's try to find and co-create local solutions that can be good for everybody there, reduce the nuisance, but let's do it all together. And this is our model, uh, to work with all the actors and uh, you know, improve all the relationships between uh, each other. This is our, our main uh, way of thinking, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, industries don't get, you know, pushed behind uh, or scared of uh, just thinking, oh, no, I will need to measure others and I will need to implement uh, corrective measures and these are very expensive and so on. But um, if we uh, understand the problem well, uh, it's necessary that maybe it's not so expensive, it doesn't have to do or maybe doesn't require an investment in some cases because uh, with good practices and so 
uh, and uh, improving the, the operational practices in the facility, it can be really reduced and everybody will be happier. So uh, my message is uh, like positive, like uh, please join us uh, with uh, like a transparency spirit uh, that uh, and, and participate with us because what we want in, in fact is uh, to improve the situation in fact for the industries which are the ones that are uh, emitting and uh, but they are really necessary for all of us so we are not against them but in favor in fact right no um, um, I hear you I mean uh, that's such an important message uh, Rosa because um, you know, for most of these facilities, which create so many jobs and then actually move the economy forward and make our lives better. Um, it's, it's also, they're doing such an awesome job, but it's also important for, um, uh, you know, uh, them to be good neighbors, uh, mm-hmm. and have that operating license, not just from regulators, but also from the neighbors. Um, so, um, I think it's such an important, um, message. And we should, of course, um, all of us think about collective action, what you've been referring to. Um, Given the scale of challenges that we face today, um, uh, given the depth of, you know, different uh, systemic changes that we need, um, I believe, you know, collective action is one of the, you know, ways in which we could achieve those goals. So um, great message, uh, great positive message. And um, I think, you know, everyone should join to, you know, make our planet better. So thank you so much, Rosa. Um, um, Do you have anything else to say before we um, end the call? No, we just encourage everybody to uh, follow the the project and also just to let you know that uh, in this spirit of co-creation, we want to co-create everything with everybody in the project. So uh, we are in the process of uh, designing uh, the International Over Observatory. So we welcome any suggestions of uh, things that you want to see inside the other observatory, because uh, for sure we will map, uh, like for example, places where regulatory actions have, have been taken, um, places with uh, other problems that we can work uh, with uh, uh, the, or methodology and so on. Good practices, places with good practices or industries that are doing, you know, uh, efforts on uh, to reduce other pollution. Also, uh, we will want to, you know, build like a library and also uh, of resources of uh, scientific articles and so on. Uh, also, corrective measurements, abatement techniques, equipment, etc., so that everybody that wants to deal with other pollution have a reference where to look at to see what are the options that they can apply. And also, we will be building the otherpedia so that uh, we will be, uh, you know, opening all the concepts to everybody else so that everybody, you know, can start understanding what other pollution is and, uh, you know, participating in the project. So we welcome any suggestions. Uh, it's, it will be co-created. We will be launching like uh, uh, consultations and so on. So if you join our newsletter or, or social networks or everything else uh, that you want or contact me directly, uh, we will appreciate it very much because it will be like a, uh, a, a common uh, effort that we All want right. to do. All right, great. Wonderful. Thanks, Rosa. So um, whoever you are and wherever you are in the world, um, I think you have a lot of opportunities to um, join the Dinosis project and make a contribution um, to it. Um, so please get in touch with Rosa, look at their website and you know um, follow them. And before we leave, I just want to uh, remind you that our 2018 Global Dialogue on Waste is starting on September 4th, and it will also be on September 5th. And we have um, some of the best speakers um, from um, around North America and um, uh, Europe, uh, because that's our focus this year, um, because of the kinds of changes that are happening in the recycling end markets and uh, the kinds of stakeholders that are getting involved in recycling. So um, uh, please um, check it out, register for the program so that you can hear and learn from some of the best people in the sector. So uh, with that, thank you so much and um, have a good day, good evening and good night. Bye. Bye.